Good morning. Uh, can you hear me fine? Um, my name is uh, Georgiana Gligor. Welcome uh, to the morning uh, talk. Um, I will uh, speak about uh, optimization tricks for large-scale uh, websites. And uh, I will uh, uh, show you a nice case study. Um, I'm uh, working with PHP for quite a long time, since 2003. Um, I'm currently consulting um, for architectural uh, and uh, DevOps uh, bits of uh, websites and uh, of course from a technology point of view, Symfony and uh, the latest React.js. Um, I'm also organizing the PHP Cluj meetup, but our meetup is much smaller. You are uh, uh, numerous people and I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I will introduce you a little bit the project because it's a very challenging project, um, the one that um, uh, I want to present to you. Our customer is uh, United States uh, Airline. Maybe you are familiar with the uh, Wizzair and the Ryanair uh, business models. Um, what they do is um, um, fly low-cost uh, destinations, but not from main airports, smaller uh, regional airports, and have a lot, a lot of customers. Um, the uh, advantage that this uh, strategy offers is that uh, on more than 90% of the routes, they don't have competition. And uh, in the United States, uh, you know every, every business is uh, 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 much larger. And try to OK, louder. <laughs> um, so um, even if it's a low-cost airline, um, for uh, if you would uh, place the same company uh, here in Europe, they would be really big. They are really an enterprise company. It's not like a very small uh, company at all. They have uh, more than uh, uh, 100 aircrafts that they own. And um, uh, the, uh, the business model that they use is a bit different uh, than what we uh, normally uh, know. Uh, they sell uh, tickets through websites. They also have a call center, so if you cannot use the website, you give a phone call and somebody will assist you. And in the end, you will get a small uh, fee on the shopping cart. And uh, of course, travel agents, which um, uh, now they sell more than uh, one uh, quarter of everything that's being sold. But a very interesting thing is that um, Allegiant Airlines doesn't uh, uh, work with um, external reservation engines. So they have their own in-house reservation engine and uh, um, they don't use, um, they are like Amadeus or Sabre, uh, some of the most well-known ones. Um, these guys have their own thing and this is actually part of the very big challenge. Um, their website um, currently sees in one year more than one billion dollars uh, of sales, which is a lot of money. And that's why um, the performance needs to be at the very top, because a lot of people are, uh, are using it. So just a simple um, sketch. Uh, the initial system that we started with um, a few years ago was um, a database which had everything in it, um, from static data to availability, and then to, of course, the reservations, and a few entry points for uh, selling different entry points for selling, and another one uh, for uh, making administration bids. Um, but our customer uh, wanted to change everything because uh, the IT department wasn't actually, uh, they were just uh, following the business. The business was expanding very uh, fast, and uh, the IT department was just uh, coming uh, from behind, and uh, they needed the, the IT to be much better uh, in this respect. So uh, the most important thing they um, said, uh, we're going to sell things based on destination. So if you go um, to Las Vegas and want to have uh, fun over the weekend, we're not just selling you a uh, um, ticket to go to Las Vegas and then to go back uh, with the airplane. We're going to help you find the hotel. We're going to help you get to the hotel with a rental car. And uh, of course, uh, in, uh, during the weekend, you buy tickets to a lot of shows and you want to go out and have fun. So we will help you also with that. Uh, this was the main goal. So not just sell plane tickets, sell almost everything uh, that you can. Um, and 
um, of course, in the United States, um, the most uh, uh, important uh, time of the year is Black Friday and the new tradition of Cyber Monday when uh, everybody buys a lot of things online. So everybody is online, everybody wants to buy, um, and uh, uh, it's a very, very uh, high traffic in that time of the year. Um, all these changes that I mentioned uh, needed to happen fast uh, because uh, uh, that's where uh, the money is. So um, we need to actually uh, move uh, just as if it were a new project, even if we had a lot of things uh, um, in the background. Um, did they impose any constraints on the uh, solution? Of course they did. Uh, they said, um, we're not going to do everything uh, with PHP. We already have PHP in-house. Um, it doesn't really work. And we explained them, yes, it, uh, it will work if we do it right. Um, and um, also, the uh, problem uh, with the geographical distribution was that um, our customer uh, is based on the Pacific time zone. So uh, that's eight hours behind London. Um, and um, on the uh, coding bit, we were in uh, Romania and in London, and the time difference was uh, very large. So uh, development is not uh, very easy if uh, uh, you're uh, talking with your colleagues late in the evening or early in the morning. So this was a, a real challenge because it uh, took a few years to uh, keep up with the communication. And of course, uh, to replace the uh, monolithic application that they had. Uh, I, I will tell you a little bit about the uh, technology stack and how we addressed this rewrite in a, uh, in a nice way. So we just picked the data that you saw in the previous diagram and said, okay, this is uh, not, not the legacy system, just the data, it's there, it's waiting for us. And um, the customer said, we want to put um, a Java service layer, uh, which is the actual booking engine. We want to put it in front of the data and we want to keep it in house uh, because of the, um, uh, regulations in the United States, you can't um, give too much of the information to um, third parties. So they said, um, whatever accesses the uh, raw data, it's going to be a Java service layer and we're going to service you JSONs. They already started that uh, when they came with the um, uh, uh, proposition to us. And uh, they said, now um, this is what we're going to give you. Uh, you only see above the Java service layer, Whatever you do, make it really blazing fast. And uh, um, the, another reason for having this separation was that uh, they could uh, go and contract any third party uh, that would access the same services if they wanted to. Um, and uh, the web-facing bit was uh, the challenge that we had to take on. Um, it's um, not a very uh, trivial task. Um, and uh, uh, what we did, I will show you a little bit. Um, uh, uh, on top of the Java services, um, we added a very thin layer of PHP. Why? Because the um, Java services communicated a lot of things. They are transactional by nature, but they are quite heavy in communication. Actually, we were lucky. Uh, that they were handing us JSONs, which has smaller uh, payload when you uh, put it uh, in the network, then m maybe if they had XML, it would have been much fat. Um, uh, but um, uh, with JSON, it was quite okay. Um, the transactions were hidden in this layer, um, but the thin PHP services um, that we added uh, were meant to make things really uh, fast and really small and uh, take each bit of the, um, uh, of the data and handle it separately. Uh, okay. Um, and um, the, the data bit that is uh, on top, um, we, uh, we placed JavaScript uh, single page applications uh, that would live in the client browser and come to the uh, PHP services and only consume the exact amount of data that they needed. So, um, you know, when, uh, when you load the page and uh, um, as, a, as a user, when you load the page, uh, it's uh, very important that you perceive 
that the speed is okay. It's not important that the speed of the loading page is fine. It's important what you feel about it. And uh, with JavaScript single page applications, this is um, uh, very easy to achieve because everything um, loads and then lives in the client browser. Um, and you only grab the data that you need and paint it on the screen and uh, the user actually feels that um, the entire application is moving very fast because only parts of the screen are repainted every time. Um, but th this is just a generic overview. Uh, the, the problem with having a lot of traffic uh, during the holidays is that um, uh, you, you can't just put a, a few servers there, like uh, three or four uh, uh, Apache servers and expect everything to go fine. Um, the amounts of traffic we were seeing were huge and uh, we actually looked at the, first, um, um, at the first Black Friday numbers and um, based on those we uh, conducted performance tests. Um, and uh, it, it became very clear that um, this is not going to work if we do it traditionally. Um, with a very flat architecture. We need to move a little bit on top of that and come up with another uh, concept. Uh, that concept for us uh, was a silo. Um, uh, by a silo, what we mean is that uh, we put all the servers that make up the application, the JavaScript single page application, the Symfony services. Um, you build, the. Uh, it's like a cluster, but we call it a silo. And then uh, with that silo, you can put as many silos as you want in horizontally, and um, it will allow you to scale. So normally during the year, maybe you have one or two silos, and when everything explodes from traffic point of view, you just add multiple silos and everything will be fine. Um, the, uh, each uh, silo contained everything about the uh, Symfony services and the front end. Um, you will notice that the front end also contains a very strange word, uh, which is called Drupal. Um, why? Because the JavaScript single page applications um, had different, um, um, a different requirements in terms of access. So if you're a travel agent, you have different permissions, you need to uh, view different things. And um, uh, when you're a website uh, booker, and you just use the normal website, you have different privileges. And uh, if you're a call center agent, uh, which is a direct employee of the customer, you want to have different privileges. So uh, this was quite a problem. And um, uh, if we had to, do, uh, to solve it uh, traditionally by writing something on our own, that would have taken a long time. And uh, our deadline was one year to do everything that uh, was web facing. So what we said, um, was um, what is important um, from an access point of view, who knows how to do this best. Uh, content management systems are excellent in this respect, so let's use that for user management. And uh, that's why um, we placed the Drupal layer to handle all the authentication bit, and then uh, encapsulate the JavaScript single page application inside, because um, they will not use uh, uh, too much of the Drupal anyway after uh, you're uh, logged in. So one silo has everything uh, in order to uh, serve the application. Um, if things go wrong, and um, I will tell you a bit more in the um, performance considerations, uh, we had to uh, add more Drupals um, or another uh, Symfony machine. You add it inside the silo. And then the horizontal scalability, you achieve it by adding more silos. Uh, let me uh, show you how this works on the same diagram. So um, all the user requests come in through an F5 load balancer. And um, the F5, um, what it does, it has uh, uh, persistence. So f um, when the user uh, first uh, reaches the F5, th they will have um, um, the user assigned to one of the silos. Uh, in our example, there are three silos. And uh, the user will remain inside the silo and all the interaction with the website uh, will uh, be carried out by the machines inside that silo. Um, and um, when, um, 
when you want to add, the, let's say, the third silo because the traffic is spiking, the load balancer will be smart enough to dissipate the load and then uh, the first two silos will uh, have time to recover because all the new sessions will go to the third silo. Um, F5 is quite a smart thing from this perspective, um, but it's uh, um, quite pricey on the other bit. So uh, if you want to use it, it's very smart. Um, you have to uh, carefully analyze if, uh, if it's uh, your fit. There are a lot of uh, cheaper options as well. <coughs> um, okay. Um, let me let me tell you a bit um, about the issues that we noticed um, in the uh, in this <coughs> um, setup. Um, you will see that everything that the user wants to request um, will flow through the, all the layers, and every time they will have to reach the database. Um, but if you look, um, the availability information is very dynamic. It changes uh, as you make a booking. Uh, the availability information changes in the um, flight industry. Um, also, the price change um, happens. So uh, there are like a bunch of uh, tickets, and if you sell all of them at one price, um, then um, the next uh, customer uh, will come in and uh, reach a different price cap. And you cannot cache this kind of data um, because um, the um, price will be uh, higher and um, also uh, you do a lot of pricing based on dates, based on uh, uh, locations, where is the customer coming from. So the availability information cannot be cached. The reservation that um, already happened and uh, the customer comes in and uh, performs a check-in online, um, this is something that can be partially cached because it happened in the past. But if the customer wants to add more items to the purchase, that is also an information that you cannot cache. But uh, the third item there is the static data. And this is something that uh, not only we can cache, but we can cache aggressively. So um, what we did was add a um, caching la layer, um, which was very, very close to the customer. So. <coughs> um, you, um, if you bring the information as close to the user as possible, uh, there will be uh, very few hops to reach the data. You will go in a straight line and fetch everything you need. Um, in our case, um, we had quite a lot of static data because uh, uh, information about the airport, information about the hotel, um, the descriptions, images, um, uh, number of rooms, this is something that doesn't change very often. It's um, uh, the perfect candidate to be uh, brought as close to the user as possible. And not only that, but uh, you can um, uh, benefit from very fast caching mechanisms like varnish. If you just put everything in varnish, it will um, be much, much faster than uh, loading things traditionally uh, via the web server. Even if you use like a very light web server that only handles the um, images, let's say, or static information, it's not as fast as varnish. So <clears throat> our main goal was to, um, to push this information very, very um, up in the technology stack and uh, um, to use a method of warming the cache. So every time um, something was changed um, <coughs> from a hotel description maybe or um, let's say a room number, um, some uh, people make mistakes and uh, uh, spell things incorrectly, these kinds of things. Um, what happens is that um, uh, this information is um, warmed in the cache. So we have a job uh, that goes and um, grabs the, uh, the data uh, and uh, warms the varnish cache with the data. So when the first user comes in and hits um, with the request, the data is already there. They, they don't need to wait for it. Okay. Um, uh, 
what I want to uh, show you now is um, how we arrange the things inside one of these silos. Um, you can have one or you can have many, but inside the silo, um, things are um, going to be quite interesting. And um, I will walk you a little bit through it. So from the F5 load balancer, you hit uh, one such silo. Um, the, the first layer is varnish, which is a very fast mechanism to, um, um, to move the request to the uh, Drupal and uh, JavaScript single page application. Um, so once the user comes in with the request, they um, are immediately assigned to a Drupal machine um, and uh, the JavaScript uh, single page application is loaded. And then all the uh, actual data requests are made to the uh, Symfony um, theme service. We had the service for flights, another one for hotels, of course, another one for seat map, um, to load all the seats in the plane to know which one is uh, taken and which one is not taken. Um, the upsell of uh, rental cars, all of these things were individual Symfony services. So you, um, inside the silo, um, we had uh, multiple uh, HTTP requests happening, but it was very fast because um, the hardware was collocated. So uh, everything was nearby. It wasn't like uh, distributed in a, uh, in a cloud. They were distributed inside, an, uh, inside the F5. Um, and uh, if you take a look at the um, right uh, hand, um, where we um, actually uh, disclose a little bit about the caching uh, bit. You will see that we have a memcache where all the sessions live and most importantly all the data that the UI will serve are living in the uh, memcache. So in Varnish maybe we have the static bits like the images but um, the data that the user requests um, about the flights and about the hotels is prefetched in memcache. So, uh, you don't need to wait until the uh, Symfony will load everything from Java and then uh, go back to the user. You just come, um, <coughs> request information from Symfony, and then uh, you go and wait in the uh, screen for data to be uh, filled in the cache. And then uh, the only thing that you hit, hit is the MAM cache, which is very, very fast compared to uh, going down the traditional route of uh, uh, data access every time. And uh, this is how, uh, how we put things in Memcache. So uh, we combine the dynamic data, in this case the availability, uh, with the static data about the um, flight. So uh, the flight number, the details about the airport, all of this information, which is in fact static. You add it to the um, JSON that comes from Java and tells you the exact availability of uh, each of them. So. Um, in an example, if you go uh, and fly from Bellingham to Las Vegas, you don't need to uh, wait for the Java layer to give you information about the Las Vegas airport. It's the same airport, it has the same coordinates. You just load the data from the static layer, which is varnished and takes you a, a very small amount to, to access, and combine it with the dynamic data and place it in memcache. And then what happens is um, at the front end, which is the SPA, single page application, will constantly go to cache and ask, do you have this information for me? Can I paint it on the screen? But only that information, not the rest of the page. The rest of the page is already in the client browser and this is a very big advantage. Okay. Um, let me show you another thing um, that from a development perspective um, was making a lot of sense to us. Uh, remember, uh, our customer was somewhere in the United States on a very crazy time zone for us, and we were uh, in Europe on different time zones. So how do you actually develop things uh, in such a way over the years? Because you uh, can, uh, let's say, uh, spend one month or two months uh, uh, living on, uh, on the US time zone, but then after one year uh, you will just collapse. It's not something that uh, you do on a regular basis. So we added this concept of fixtures and um, every component that uh, we decided to add in our project 
Oh, it was a symphony component or the uh, JavaScript uh, application. Mm, we uh, looked at it as a black box and said, okay, what are the inputs, what are the outputs? This is a little bit similar to BDD, where you uh, actually add the scenarios and um, look what's in there. Uh, but what we did was describe everything in JSON. So up front, we picked all the contracts of the component uh, for every request and sketched um, JSON input, JSON output, discussed the um, HTTP headers that we're going to use, and we called those fixtures. Um, wh why were they important? for input and output. Because in isolation, you could actually go to the component, have it tested automatically. You didn't need to uh, load the full stack. If you noticed, the uh, number of servers was uh, quite large. And uh, with this technique, you just pick um, the individual component and um, uh, perform all the testing that you need because you discussed everything up front. And then you go and code in your own time zone at your own pace. And at the end, you just integrate with the real service. But um, everything is already handled on your side because all the scenarios were discussed up front and um, the normal questions like uh, how do we do error handling, what happens in this case, in this other case, all of these things uh, were discussed in advance. So, uh, I've listed some of the advantages of uh, using this technique. Um, the most important one for us was that um, before writing any single line of code, we were actually uh, discussing about the uh, contracts between components. Um, some of these discussions actually emerged into changing a little bit the way we thought things would go, of course. And uh, it's um, uh, another a uh, very good thing that uh, you don't spend time refactoring, you just spend time discussing in the beginning. Um, the traditional uh, advantage of uh, allowing the developer to code at any time they please, uh, independently on their machine. If you're a JavaScript developer, you don't need to install all the PHP things on your machine, you just install your JavaScript uh, uh, nice things. Or if you're a Symfony developer, you don't have to worry about uh, um, installing the JavaScript bit and making it communicate with yours. And uh, the, maybe the JavaScript client application is uh, also moving. They may have bugs. You don't want to fix their bugs. You don't want to have that problem. Um, so you just um, define the scenarios in the beginning, call them fixtures, and run like a script. Um, as if the requests were coming from uh, a different component. And of course, the advantage of having independent tests for each component, that then we could integrate into the uh, continuous integration uh, bit and have them all run separately. Um, I will add another, um, another idea that uh, is maybe not pictured here. Um, it's very important that uh, when you find a bug, bugs occur every time, um, you use this fixture-based technique uh, and describe the bug with the actual inputs and outputs, and then um, uh, it will never happen again because it's integrated into your test suite, and um, uh, you don't introduce regression. Or if you are about to introduce it, it's very easy to spot it because it lies in your test suite. Okay. I, uh, these were all very boring things, nothing to do with the code, only with the architecture. I will show you something more, uh, more fun. Um, the 204 trick. Um, what does it mean? The 204 is about the uh, status code. So 204 is a success status code. Um, and what is, uh, it says? It... Uh, um, um, it says that uh, I will not return you anything. I received your request. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my job to fulfill it. I will do some validation, of course, on your request. Maybe you didn't ask me to do the right things. Um, but um, I acknowledged it, and I will take care of it. You just need to go and query the cache uh, for the actual result. 
So uh, you can do um, UI loading, you can uh, do a lot of other things in the time that I will spend um, going and fetching the data. And uh, this is very important that uh, um, it adds to the perceived speed of the application. That's why we call it a trick. And uh, maybe uh, something uh, like a, a diagram will help you a bit more. So um, when, let's say, the user comes in uh, unauthenticated, they're just a user that wants to purchase plane tickets. And um, they perform a search. They hit the Drupal, uh, which um, uh, encapsulates the JavaScript single page application that I, I was talking about. And uh, um, what Drupal does, it's, uh, it says, OK, I received the search. Uh, please, Symfony service, uh, do this search for me. And the Symfony service uh, will say, oh, of course, um, I will do just that. Hang on just a little bit. Um, in this time, the Drupal uh, bit uh, will perform some in initialization of the JavaScript single page application, like um, um, uh, they will um, tell you if it's a production application or not, and all of those configuration bits that are required to start the single page application um, will be there. And uh, uh, you see that um, the UI can load, but in this time, the Symfony service who received such request, they will go to Java and have the discussion about availability. Um, Java will return the data. And um, <coughs> also, um, the next thing that Symfony does is uh, init manifest. This is a concept that we introduced for every search. Um, you have a manifest that describes it. Um, what were the departing and the returning airports? What was the time frame for the search? So uh, this was a description of a search that we uh, placed in Memcache and everybody could come in and uh, query all the components, could come in and say, uh, what is the status of this search? You just had the identifier of the search, the manifest identifier. Um, so this is why the init manifest uh, step is there. In this time, the Java service will already uh, come back with the data, uh, and this data will put in Memcache, and it will wait there. The JavaScript single, application, single page application um, started to load, but uh, then they will just go and, uh, with a manifest that came from Drupal, they would go to the uh, cache and say, uh, what status is this in? If in the manifest you, uh, they don't find an address where to go and load the flights for, um, from, uh, they will just say, OK, hang on a little bit. And then at some point, um, the manifest will contain the information about the flights, and uh, we can um, have them displayed in the UI. So um, why, why is this technique uh, interesting? Because Symfony does the heavy lifting, and um, the UI bit uh, um, of the JavaScript uh, application uh, can actually show the user things are moving. They don't wait uh, for Java to come back with the results, because maybe uh, it's not uh, um, going to happen very fast. We do have a two-second uh, uh, limit, friendly limit from Java to return data, but uh, sometimes it's uh, not met, so if the user has to wait for uh, something to happen in the interface for more than two seconds. Maybe they will get bored and uh, they will go to a different airline. <coughs> OK. Uh, the same technique can be applied in a lot of places. Um, if you use microservices, you uh, do make HTTP requests to other components. So um, I'm uh, uh, picking a batch processing example uh, that can show um, how this uh, technique can be used. Of course, every time when a request is coming, you just go and uh, uh, check if it's valid. If the user is not authenticated and you require him to be, you just um, give a friendly message, hey, it's not allowed. Um, then you do the actual validation, if it's a broken JSON uh, or if it's too large or maybe it's too small, just it doesn't contain everything you need. Um, you also tell him uh, friendly that, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, not something I can do for you. But after the first two steps um, are, uh, have happened, 
uh, then you uh, can use the no content trick and say, hey, I got your back. Go and do other things. Um, I will save all this data for you or whatever you're doing in the uh, batch operation. Of course, you do the <coughs> uh, batch processing after returning. And of course, a little bit of a code, how to actually close a connection. Um, you just uh, push the 204 header and then you have to declare that uh, you're not going to give any content, so uh, you put a value of zero in the content length header. In our case, uh, we said, yeah, we're working with JSON. And then you flush the output if, uh, for example, if you have uh, in Apache, the output buffering already um, started, depending on your configuration, you might need to do OB flush. Um, so to flush the output buffer and then uh, do the flush. Uh, this is a, a very simple way of uh, uh, returning the data, but it doesn't work in all the cases, like <coughs> the uh, most uh, prominent one is uh, test environment. So if you start it with PHP unit, it will uh, start freaking out about uh, headers or this end, and then uh, there are some other cryptic errors. So uh, we had to come up with a more clever strategy. Um, I'm showing you the Symfony specific one because that's uh, what we were using, our very thin uh, PHP uh, layer uh, is written in Symfony. So um, the stream is a very interesting uh, uh, part of the HTTP package of Symfony. Uh, you just start a new stream spawn, tell it to be a tool for um, status. And then you um, add the close connection. Um, but stream response, it's meant to stream data to the client browser. So you can use it in a lot of other scenarios where you actually do want to send data. But because we don't want to send data, we just initialize it with an empty callback. So we don't do anything because we're not going to give anything to the caller. And then, of course, send the request. Uh, but if in the stream response, if you uh, want to, I don't know, if you process 1,000 records and you want to show, I processed one, I processed another one, what you will do in the currently do nothing method, you will just go in and say echo a dot and then flush and then echo another dot when the other item is finished and then you flush and then um, uh, they will come in uh, and you are able to um, have a visual overview of the processing status um, batch uh, thing that uh, uh, because it's a batch example. Um, but for our case, we don't want to return anything, so the function uh, is completely empty. Of course, if you have a trick at your belt, you start shooting everything with the same trick. Um, but uh, in our case, uh, this wasn't, um, uh, it didn't start like this. Um, the same 204 trick um, we wanted to use because um, if we had two Drupals or three Drupals and 304 Symfony machines, then a memcache and uh, all these things in the same silo and then you have two or three silos at the same time, uh, what are the logs that you are going to search in? Do you go in uh, searching syslog for all these machines? Um, how exactly are you going to uh, make uh, use of this information. If something breaks, you're quite uh, on your own, and we don't want to do that. So we wrote a small uh, logging system. We called it the black box. It's not a fancy name. Um, we wanted logging to be cheap. So if something happens, I have an event, I just want to throw it to the logging systems and forget about it. Um, that's why the 204 trick comes in very handy, because it just tells me, yeah, yeah, I will save this information for you, don't worry. Um, another thing um, that uh, is absolutely required from logging is to not impact application performance. Um, if you use Symfony, the most traditional way of logging things is using the file system. Um, it's very expensive to read and write from the file system. We didn't want to do that. Uh, for us, it was um, much cheaper to open a connection to the logging system, then use that connection to uh, just uh, push in data. And uh, a very good advantage 
of uh, having a centralized logging system was to uh, be able to uh, search through what happened and then uh, tell the story of a user's journey, um, which is uh, quite, uh, quite important. Um, you could actually see how things were, uh, were happening. You know this diagram, uh, it's quite clear. Any application, any component that wants to log data will just uh, give the information to black box. And if there are missing critical fields like the date the event occurred, the black box will say, you know what, I, I cannot save something that you don't know when it happened. Uh, but if you have the minimal things like a date and uh, uh, some actual data that you want to log, it will just tell you, uh, okay, fine, save the data. Um, it's very important that when you go to the database to save the data, you just open the connection once in the black box and then you just use the same connection to write data. And uh, the second really big advantage is that uh, the database is something you can query. The file system logs are not very uh, uh, searchable and if you want to aggregate them into uh, an ELK stack, uh, it's going to take a lot of time to do just that. While in the database, you just use your existing skills of uh, doing a query and uh, you can immediately find uh, what's going on. Just a very short uh, picture. It's a screenshot that I took uh, about last year uh, to show you how this logging system is actually debugging. Um, and if you, if you want, I can uh, uh, show you afterwards uh, <coughs> some uh, uh, real life examples. But um, in here you can see that we assigned a different color to every component because when you load this, um, there are a lot of events. You see at the bottom the yellow line. It's uh, the, the time uh, that it takes to uh, perform things. So initially uh, the user made the request a search um, and uh, then we performed the parallel search for every component um, and then while the user was deciding on what hotel they would stay and browsing you see that the time is uh, dilating very much uh, no, not many things happening afterwards um, but uh, mm, the advantage is um, in this logging system you can actually pair events so the start and end event you can pair them together and look in the UI what's going on and how long it took and uh, uh, sometimes um, if uh, things go over the service level agreement, oh my god, just respond in two seconds, they respond in five. You can just put a, a red error event in the timeline and then you can collect how many of these are happening. Uh, is this a problem um, normally or is it just something that occurred once? And the bubble. So if you click on one of the uh, time things, you can see there are uh, two, there may be more events if you group them together with a key. So when you log an event, you can say, um, I have this key, please uh, log it for me. And then the second event, the end, will come in with the same key. So in the UI, you just aggregate the uh, events based on the key. Um, and you can see the duration. There are a lot of things that uh, can be extracted from here. Okay. Um, I promised I will talk a little bit about HTTP status codes because it's the most descriptive way that somebody can uh, uh, use to signal what's going on. And uh, I will briefly go over the error handling bit where we use quite heavily um, error codes. So <coughs> normally there are two types of errors um, from uh, our perspective, the front end and the back end. Um, we wanted to have a very, very distinct separation between recoverable errors, something that I didn't find things in the cache, um, or um, um, uh, other things that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the seat that the user chose in the airplane, they wanted to stay on A4, but until they got to the payment bit, the seat is taken by somebody else who's faster. This is also a recoverable error. So uh, the user can continue inside the booking path. While um, 
non-recoverable means something really blew up and the user has to start all over again, but it's important for them um, to find out really fast. And uh, when you design communication between components, it's very important to make a clear distinction between these errors. And um, what we did was uh, to use uh, uh, status codes from the 4XX family uh, to see that uh, coverable uh, errors were happening. Maybe uh, you didn't have permission. And I just tell you, OK, uh, take the user back to the login page. Um, maybe you are not uh, allowed to perform an operation. Um, from the back end, I'm telling the user should remain in the same uh, page. And uh, conflict is uh, an example I gave you earlier, when somebody uh, booked a seat. And uh, um, when they got to the purchase page, uh, it was already uh, purchased. So for this kind of uh, situations, we use the conflict code. Or maybe you come up with uh, something very large. If I'm the logging system, and you come up with one megabyte of JSON, maybe I don't want to log that. I'm going to tell you, you know what, uh, I'm a very friendly logging system, but I can only handle uh, smaller amounts of data. So um, all these data codes um, are something that uh, uh, tell you that the uh, client can recover. If you give me a smaller JSON, I will log it, of course. But with this one, it's too large. Um, and the other family of errors is the non-recoverable ones. So if the service is not available, maybe you know it from the varnish uh, cache, or uh, something really bad happened to the server, um, the backend component will just issue a non-recoverable code and say, I, I have no idea how to fix this. Show something horrible to the user and uh, tell them uh, various scenarios that uh, they can do to recover, help them in the UI, but I, I cannot handle this. Very short thing. Um, in the logging system that you saw before, uh, one of the most important things was to execute things in parallel. So if the user comes in, um, searches for flights, you show them 20 flights, 100 flights, it doesn't matter. They pick the departing flight and the returning flight. What happens next? Um, you know uh, what the destination is. So you know where to get the hotels from. You know if the user already selected the flights, you know exactly what seat maps you want to show. So you don't wait for the user to go to the page uh, and then ask, oh, I need to show the seat map for this flight. No, because you know in the moment when they selected the flight, you know a lot of things uh, that you want to already fetch and place in the cache and show them to the user. So what we did was uh, use a handy trick from uh, CURL. Um, you will notice that uh, CURL has a multi something uh, family of methods that allows you uh, using the same PHP that you know, CURL, but um, it can do things in parallel. So you start multiple things at the same time, and the one that takes the most uh, will actually dictate when you return. How, how do we use this in practice? Very simple. User finishes uh, selecting flights, and then we go and fetch everything at the same time. Hotels, vehicles, shuttles, everything that we want uh, to UI, we place immediately in the cache. And then the user just goes and uh, loads that information. Uh, you can see that the UI can be updated to the next step. So um, when you uh, move the JavaScript single page application to the next page, uh, you just fill in all the details and then go and grab the hotel JSON and paint, uh, paint the hotels on the screen. Very fast, very quick. Um, what happens inside the Symfony service? How do you actually marry the static data and the dynamic data? Well, it's very simple. Um, you go to Varnish, which is very fast and gives you the static data quite uh, immediately. And, uh, you fetch the availability from Java, mix thing, and uh, place it in, uh, in memcache. And if you want, you can return the JSON, but it's not important to return it. It's important to have it uh, correctly placed in the memcache. So a very quick recap of the main ideas. 
what was the most important concept that we discovered on an architectural level, silos. You put all the application, all the stack, you make it as minimal as possible, and then uh, inside it, maybe uh, you want to add more Drupal servers, maybe you don't need more Drupal servers, you need more Symfony servers. Um, you just optimize one silo, and then when uh, traffic hits you, you just add more silos. Um, it's very simple to do if you have good DevOps. If you don't, uh, start learning. Um, the static data trick, don't go to the heavy database every time. Get the data in front of your user as fast as you can. Um, if you keep the user happy, it's very nice, but you have to keep the developers uh, happy as well. So using fixtures was our solution to uh, keep every component totally independent from the others that were communicating with it. If you can, delegate responsibility. Uh, have your Symfony service do all the heavy lifting <coughs> and uh, uh, make them responsible for it. You just go in the cache and uh, say, where is my data? And of course, uh, if you can execute things in parallel, like we did, center the user journey around the destination, go and fetch everything else in parallel, and then um, the user will, uh, will think you have the most uh, amazing website to all because it instantly responds to everything uh, you have. Any questions? Uh, did you consider to use uh, message queues uh, instead of that uh, tricks with the 204 code and uh, CURL? Yes. Um, actually, uh, we tried some performance tests on some message queues, and the overhead they were adding was quite heavy. Um, the 204 trick, what it does, it uses the existing resources. It doesn't add more things to the stack, and we discovered by measuring that it's much faster. And uh, it just goes to the bare metal and uses everything that is already in place. Um, the HTTP um, server is there, um, and the database is there, everything is there. We just wrote a very, very thin layer of uh, uh, doing this. While a message queue adds a lot, a lot of things to the table, and you also have to manage them, not only in terms of execution time, but also in terms of uh, DevOps. It was a bit too much for, for our taste. Okay, thank you. Okay, no more questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>